Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming and uh, my appreciation to the university for being asked to come and talk about this important issue. And I'd like to point out that it's very exciting for a historian to be asked to talk to a group of people, most of whom are interested in contemporary policy issues. Because I have been personally convinced for a long time that historians have a significant amount to contribute to policy debates, but that uh, many of us do not make the efforts to engage in these debates. And therefore, I hope that I can show you, at least to a certain extent, that the history of policing, even in the 19th century, relates to contemporary policy debates. Now, some of you heard me talk this morning. And for those of you who did, you're going to get really bored because I'm saying the same thing again, but I'll say it with some additional Phillips, and I hope that we do have a good bit of time to enter into some discussion. The question that I'm addressing is one of community policing. You can't be alive in the 1990s and not know that com community policing is a hot issue. And what I'm going to show you is a little graph that will explain why. And I'm only going to show you part of the graph, and that part which fits the argument. This, these, these are the two lines of homicides per capita. The upper line is homicides per capita in New York City from 1950 to about 1992. The lower line is homicides per capita in the United States. Why do I use homicides? Homicides, as soon as one tries to go back in time, homicides are the only offense which is reasonably consistently measured over a long time period. And towards the end of my talk, I'll show you the rest of my graph, which goes back into the 19th century. But if you want to talk about criminal offense rates over a long period of time, you are left with nothing but homicide rates. Now, for those of you who are working on the topic, you already know that homicide rates may not relate to, let's say, burglary or robbery. True. But Measuring burglary, robbery, other assaults over a long time period is extraordinarily difficult, if not, if not impossible. So to look at the past in a consistent way, you've got to look at homicide. Okay, now back to this line. Why, are we, why is community policing hot? Well, here's homicides. It's no news at all to know that both nationally and then especially in cities, Homicide rates have been escalating since the 1950s. And community policing promises something new, or something old, depending on who you listen to. Uh, and it promises, if it's promising something old, it promises a return to the good old days, let's say the 1950s or the 19th century. Anyone who's concerned about violence is willing, I think, to look at a change that promises to affect levels of violence. So, we're in trouble. One of the interesting sidelights of this graph, actually, and I'll just point this out because probably some of you have noticed it. This lower line, remember, is the US homicides per capita. Look at the early 1950s. The overall US homicide per capita rate was higher than it was for the city of New York. For those of us who can't help but notice that big cities have big homicide rates, it's pretty remarkable to think that going back 40 years, that wasn't necessarily the case. That's not the subject of my talk, but that is a really interesting little detail of this graph. Okay, now let's talk about the history of police and how that ultimately relates to policing. I'm going to do a couple of things, and I hope it's not too confusing. First of all, in case it is confusing, let me tell you my basic argument and the basic point of this talk is community policing is no. That's my point. But what I'm going to do is show you how uh, you can look at the history of police in the United States and make a different analysis and say, oh, community policing is a return to the past, to the good old days. So the first part of my lecture will be a narrative of the history of policing, which you can see how uh, you can make up a history of policing which looks like policing has drifted away from being community oriented. Then the second part of my talk, I'm going to look at the political structure of policing in the United States and show you what I think is something more correct, and that is that p community policing really is no. So first of all, let me talk about uh, community policing as being 
uh, the history of policing as being something that's adrift away from community. And in both, when I give you both stories, I'm not telling you lies. That is, the factual part of my stories are both correct, and it's the interpretation that's significant. All right. In the United States, policing begins in the early 19th century with two, with a, with a, what was called a police force or a police divided into two parts. The night watch, which is composed of volunteers, and a constable who did day duties and supervised the night watch. Now, the night watch was, from the beginning, known as being an ineffective and incompetent. Uh, usually, night watch officers were men who were otherwise unemployable. This was not an attractive job. Uh, why wasn't it attractive? Well, for one thing, the night watch was supposed to be composed of volunteers, similar to jury duty, only much worse, uh, which is hard to believe. The volunteers for the night watch were supposed to spend a certain number of nights per year. These were men over the age of 21. Uh, they were supposed to spend a certain number of nights per year patrolling from sundown to sunup. Those were the hours which made winter a lot longer than summer and a lot colder. Uh, why didn't the night watch do a good job? Well, first of all, probably they couldn't have done a good job. They didn't want to be there. And for the most part, they weren't actually volunteers. But instead, they were substitutes. Because I suspect if I asked all of you to volunteer to do night watch duty, um, and I told you that for a couple of bucks you could get out of it and I would hire a substitute, you would all decide right away that you'd hire a substitute. Now, Beth, the same thing's true for jury duty, by the way. Um, Hiring substitutes from the beginning was actually the way the Night Watch was funded. So while it wasn't a formal force, it was an informal force. These officers were supervised by constables who told them what to do, who made sure they showed up, and attempted to make sure that they stayed awake and out of trouble all night long. All the evidence is, though, that the Night Watch um, either slept or definitely stayed out of trouble by avoiding anyone who looked like they might be a criminal. Uh, there's not, I have never read anything good about the Night Watch. The constables, who were the day officers, are more interesting because they, too, uh, were, supported, they were supported by fees, not salaries. They were not uniformed. They, there was, they could wear anything they wanted. And their fees came from doing everything from arrests to uh, working for courts, similar to uh, bailiffs or sheriff's deputies, to... Uh, uh, serving civil, civil summons, doing all kinds of work. The, night, the, the constable, and the, a good constable, it's pretty clear, can make a lot of money because they did all of this legal work and got paid for it. So being a constable wasn't a bad job. Constables did not patrol. They did not deter crime. How could you get, if you're working for a fee, you can't get paid for stopping something that's about to happen. They could only get money for arresting people. So the constable, while it was a flexible job, and it was a job that did a lot of services, but it, crime prevention was not a part of it. Okay, in this story, in the middle of the 19th century, urban police, uh, urban uniform police, begin to replace the night watch and the constable. And this is a major change. Uh, in the United States, these are mod modeled on the English uniform police, and the notion is these new police will have a semi-military organization, Part of that is represented by the uniform. They're, the, they're virtually the first people working for the cities who were in uniform. Uh, and this was an, actually an issue of contention. They were organized from the top down with a chief who told them what to do. Uh, they had to serve on a regular basis. They had to patrol the streets on a regular basis. And part of that patrolling was the expectation that they would deter crime. The police officers themselves were hired uh, often as political appointees, which meant that from the beginning in the U.S., these political <coughs> appointees were uh, members of ethnic groups and the most underrepresented and poorest ethnic group in American cities in the middle of the 19th century were Irish immigrants. So often Irish immigrants became police officers. The, the tradition of the Irish cop really begins very early in the 19th century. These are jobs that are good for, for politicians to deal out. Uh, it means that officers are not hired by any, with any kinds of testing or qualification. 
Yeah. Some of the early police officers are African Americans. It was not usually noted at the time, and you have to go back through old photographs to find this. But police officers then came in, uh, usually at a political level. They were not trained in any way that we would think of, and you could say they represented the community. The uniform, though, was a way to quickly get them under control. And when I show you my slides in a minute, that will become uh, more understandable. In the 1890s, major police reform begins in the United States. And the name I put up here to make you remember this is Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, who later becomes president, is a police commissioner in New York City. He takes the job very seriously. It's a, his, his position as police commissioner is interesting. What does he do? He's a, he's a true progressive. He fights police corruption because New York City police by this time are very corrupt. Uh, I mean, even the political appointing of police officers is, in essence, corruption. So he fights corruption. He begins to reform the police and take away duties that are not really essential to policing. He begins to shake them up and make them look more and more like a contemporary police department. In this transition that uh, Teddy Roosevelt is a part of and the beginning of the reform of the police, police more and more get a tight organization, a coherent organization, an organization that is semi-military, where one of the emphases is on controlling the police officers. And that's part of the story of the uniform. If a police officer isn't in a uniform, how are you going to control them? So there's a growing emphasis over the second half of the 19th century on, uh, on control. If we look at some of my pictures, sorry. This first picture is of the various badges of the New York Police Department. And the one that's important here is the top badge, which is the first badge of the New York Police down to about 1857. This is the badge that police officers wore before they had uniforms. The significant thing about the picture, and I hadn't figured it out until recently, is that the badge is removable. It's got a little chain. You can wear it like a pocket watch. And what this meant was that police officers could, first of all, change it from coat to coat and shirt to shirt because they didn't have a uniform. But then secondly, when it was inconvenient, they could remove it. When would it be inconvenient? Well. Whenever they wanted to stop in a bar, which was pretty often, uh, whenever they wanted to not be noticed by their bosses, and at, at, a, at the lowest level of a police officer, the boss would be someone called a roundsman. And a roundsman job was to go around and make sure police officers were out walking their beats. How would you know who they were when their badge was hidden? So the removable badge is very important for these early police officers. And when police get uniforms, this is a major problem because they don't want to be identified. Uh, let me show you one other, one other badge. This is a captain's badge, but again, you'll notice that it can be hung. It's a suspendable badge. Uh, it means that the, the, what we think of as the formality of a police officer is just beginning in the middle of the 19th century. And the move towards a uniform is a major change. This picture is a drawing from about 1880. And you can see two police officers, one on each side of the gate. And they've got a row of women and a row of men. The women is moving in first. These police officers are letting unemployed homeless people into lodging rooms in the New York City police. Because one of the extra jobs that police officers did in their early life, one of the many extra jobs, was taking in the poor. Overnight lodging was provided for the homeless. And these people were called, if you look at old police records, they were called lodgers. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll say, what's a lodger? The lodging that they provided varied from regime to regime, from city to city. Some cities, and I'll show you a couple pictures, it was pretty horrible. Other cities actually provided breakfast, um, beds, and even job counseling. Typically, the way it worked was that lodgers were let in at a certain time of night and let out at a fairly early in the morning, 6 a.m. Uh, sometimes they slept in hallways. Sometimes they slept in special rooms. One of Teddy Roosevelt's reforms was to end lodging. Now, I would say in 1997, you would say, why is this a reform? 
sounds pretty un First of all, the fact that people, police did this is amazing to us. And secondly, the idea that you would take it away is even more amazing. He took away lodging for a couple of reasons. First of all, he said, well, a lot of these folks have tuberculosis and they're going to make our police officers sick. That's one thing. The other thing he said is, this is the beginning of police focusing in more and more on crime. And what does this have to do with crime control? Get them out of here. The third reason that he got rid of lodging is the most amazing to me, and that is lodging was bad for the poor. Why was it bad for the poor? Because it encouraged them to not be thrifty and work hard. If you give out, the notion was, if you give out charity without people working for it or deserving it, it's going to make them lazy. And it will make them be even more, there will be even more poverty. So getting rid of overnight lodging was a way to deal with poverty. And the New York City Police Department, by the end of the 1890s, had gotten rid of lodging. The poor, if they, went, if they found lodging in the city, found lodging in municipally run lodging houses. And municipally run lodging houses had a work test. And the work test typically was that in the morning after a night's lodging, the the, the men had to either chop wood or break rocks, and I'm not sure what the task for the women was, but there was a task for both. From the point of view of these people, the poor people who were often day laborers, this was terrible because it meant they missed the morning job market. And what happened actually is a lot of, in New York City, a lot of the very poor then went to New Jersey or somewhere else to get police station lodging. And interestingly enough, a sidelight is, many police chiefs resisted having this taken away. And I found um, a statement from the chief in D.C. who said, look, these people are not criminals. They need housing. The police, is a good, the police are a good agency to supply this. It's a socially useful function, and we should not have it stripped away. But it got stripped away anyhow. Uh, but, so police were really engaged in this very, very flexible business which begins to end. Uh, I think by 1920, lodging has ended in almost every city although I'm not sure, and it wouldn't surprise me if someday someone finds lodging going on down through the 1930s. <coughs> Just so you get the idea that lodging wasn't luxurious, this is a male lodger. It's a photograph from the 1890s in New York City. The fact that he's sleeping on the ground means that all of their other facilities were overwhelmed. But you'll also see off to the right, uh, excuse me, the left, that he's sleeping by a pot belly stove, so if it's winter time, at least he's warm. And here's a woman lodger, uh, again from the same time period. The plank is what she was going to be sleeping on. So you know that this was not luxury housing. About 10 more years down the road, this is 1898, and this is a useful photograph. This is, again, uh, this is a precinct house in New York. I don't know which one. But this photograph shows the complete police staff. And what you see here, first of all, you see the captain who is sitting down who has a slightly different hat. You see the mascot dog on a chair. Uh, you see most of the police officers with, in uniform off to the, up to the uh, right, yeah, no, the left, your left, you see a detective. Detective bureaus start getting created city by city in the 1870s and 80s. They're created very slowly. Uh, many states, many police departments don't get them for a long time. And in this case, the detective is in plain clothes. I'm not sure, I, I don't know how often detectives were not in uniform, and it's an important question, but I don't know. And then finally, in the middle of the picture, you'll see a woman. And she is a police officer. She's got a badge, but she doesn't have a uniform. Women don't get into uniform yet, but they are definitely doing police duties. This is 1898, so we know there's a woman police officer in New York as early as 1898. She would have been in charge of the female lodgers. She probably would have been in charge of the lost children, and she was certainly in charge of the women who were, who were arrested and jailed. Uh, it's often, the way, the way you often find out about early police history is actually through these photographs. Uh, this is how you look for early African-American police officers. It's how you look for women, how you begin to figure out what's going on, because it's sometimes not a part of the formal story, simply because no one at the time thought it was important to tell. 
This is slightly later. This is 1901. This is a police vehicle, one of the early police vehicles known in New York as the Black Maria for hauling in people who had been arrested. And here we have picture 1890, I think this is 1893, of one of the specialties that police develop that they keep for a long time, traffic. You see the police officer is off to the right-hand side here. Uh, this is pre-automobile traffic. Unfortunately, the picture doesn't show any traffic, but believe me, most urban street scenes at this time show a tremendous amount of traffic. But the important thing here is to see that here's a duty of the police, which by this time of this picture, 1915, has grown. And this, is, um, this is a wonderful picture. Well, I think it's a wonderful picture because for, for someone who imagines that traffic is a, contempt, is a recent problem, this should straighten you out real fast. Imagine having uh, automobiles, omnibuses, and horses all on the same street. Here's the horse. Here's our police officer trying to straighten out this mess. It's an important duty of police, and it, it's one which only recently, in some places, it has begun to be taken away. This is my last slide. This is showing, this is showing the increasing application of technology to policing. This is New York City's first radio car in 1931. At least that's what the museum picture says. I haven't been able to find any evidence of an actual radio. But anyhow, it's clearly some police officers in a car. And it's clearly a technological innovation. From the point of view that sees policing as a drift from its community base, this really exemplifies the big change then. Automobile policing, policing away from the beat, into the car, out of the community. And it's as early as 1931. Beat policing continues, certainly in New York City, much longer, but it's the beginning of what some people see as the end. By the way, if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt. OK, let me move quickly ahead with narrative one, the story of the police disappearance from the community. By this, this morning, I talked a little bit about an important TV show, Dragnet. Um, and I asked this morning how many people have seen Dragnet, and I got a handful. How many of you have seen Dragnet? Not enough. OK. Uh, Dragnet's really important. Why? Because Jack Webb, the producer, actor, writer, developer of the series, worked very closely with Chief Parker of the LAPD. Chief Parker is a, a chief in a long series of very famous reform police chiefs in the 20th century, starting with August Fulmer and Orlando Wilson, a series of police chiefs who continued the technology, continued the bureaucratic development, continued the emphasis on policing being highly technically controlled, one of the objects of which is to control the police officer on the street. Parker and Webb worked like this. And the important thing about Dragnet is that uh, the vision we see in it is a vision that an innovative police chief really worked on producing. It's a vision where the police have special knowledge, they're highly trained, they're very efficient, they're unemotional. Uh, and this is what the LAPD wanted us to see. But it's more than that. This is what the LAPD wanted to be. This is the direction they wanted to go. And it's a direction that's the complete opposite from what we think of as being community policing. Uh, and therefore, uh, you could see how someone making an innovation today in policing would say, look what's happened. Look how militarized the police have come. Look how separate they've come, become from the community, going around in cruisers with air conditioning with the windows up, completely detached, completely militarized, completely organized in a very hierarchical, top-down manner. And we need to return to our roots. That's the view of community policing, where you return to the roots. All right. Now, I'm going to give you version two which is there's no returning to roots in community policing. This is the right way to do it. And the right way to do it is to 
is to understand the nature of American policing as being unique to our political system, which is unique. And for this, I like to emphasize the, the nature of federalism, because federalism is something that's there and we almost always forget about. But let, re, let me remind you, after the revolution, the, the drafters of the Constitution created a government built on the most recent and best European models. We still have that government. So we have the best government of the late 18th century that you can get. In the meanwhile, things in Europe changed. More specifically, in England, which we modeled our laws and our organizations on, in particular our policing, in England, there were big time changes. England's government continued to centralize. When the English police are invented, they are a top-down innovation from London going outwards. And the template for policing, which was introduced in a series of acts from the 1830s to the 1850s, is the same everywhere in England. When Americans in the 1850s looked at England, they weren't thinking about this. They were thinking, hey, look at those police of London. They're incredible. We need them here in New York. Let's copy them. Well, they couldn't be copied. It's not the same place. And the, the contrast should be made between the United States and Canada, which we seldom do. Canada gets its independence in the second half of the 19th century. After the English have reformed city government, after the English have created and reformed policing. So Canadian government is much more hierarchical, it's much more consistent from province to province. It's, it's a government much more similar to that of England than ours. And ours, in, a, in our federal system, I mean, think of it. There are 50 different uh, criminal codes. Think of it, they're just a handful of federal crimes. I mean, crime, for the most part, is about offenses defined state by state by state, and it varies. Uh, and then, even more, uh, when it comes to policing, police departments are urban. They belong not to, they, no, there's some corrections in the past 20 years, because there are now some county police departments, I'll admit. But police departments are units of local government. There is no reason that they have to be consistent from place to place, and they aren't. They vary enormously from place to place. And they can. There's no reason that, that they have to and they won't. Uh, this is why, uh, whereas in, in uh, England, which is the best comparison, police departments are highly similar from place to place. Police officers can move. In France, it's even more centralized. Police chiefs come from the central government and are sent out to a city. It's a very centralized system. It's more like, well, there isn't a good comparison in the US. It's a, so uh, for us, federalism has made a system that's unique and highly different, and as a result, highly differentiated. It means that the way Los Angeles does it is not the way Houston does it. Or if it is, it's a big surprise. Uh, these things are varied, and it's a, it is, I won't say it's a problem, it's just the nature of the United States may in the long run be a solution. Not only that, but because policing comes out of local government, in particular cities, police in the United States are connected to the executive. They're part of the mayor's functions or the county executive function rather than being connected to the courts. If you rewind back to the constables for a second, constables basically worked usually for courts. They were similar to sheriffs or bailiffs or marshals. But the police come out of a county executive function or a city executive function. So policing structurally is very different in the United States from anywhere else. Okay, where am I? Uh, this is why, this is why American police get this wild range of duties in the late 19th century. And the wild range, I didn't put them all up here. Police really did inspect boilers. Police in Denver really did shoot stray dogs. Uh, police took, you already know, they took in the homeless. Police did, uh, police took censuses in dozens of cities. Every year they took a new census to get a count of the population. <coughs> police did what we would call sanitary inspection. Huge range of jobs, and it varied. Some cities, they did more than others. There's no reason they had to be the same. 
As the 19th century winds down, if we go to the 1890s, these various functions get taken away from the police. Not because the police did a bad job, but because they become professionalized. Uh, boiler inspection is the easiest to understand. Boilers get very complicated. Engineers are trained in universities and technological colleges. They become, the, they become part of a city bureaucracy, an engineering bureaucracy that inspects boilers. This is suddenly no longer a job for the police. Uh, censuses are done by state, county, and city demographers. A lot of the extra police jobs become professionalized. As they become professionalized, they go away to separate bureaucracies. What doesn't become professionalized? Traffic control and crime control. So the police, in a way, are left with a residual function. And this residual function, uh, tr do traffic and crime control have any close relationship? Not necessarily. Why are they in the same organization? Because that organization has done all sorts of things for a long period of time. Are the police particularly good at them? Not necessarily. Uh, are the police particularly good at crime control? Well, who knows? How would you tell? Uh, but that's what the job is left with. Uh, now, someone might say to me, oh, come on. In the case of crime control, what about police science, which grows in the 1920s uh, with August Vollmer and a whole series of people? Well, if you look at what police science was in the 1920s, I think you would agree with me that it wasn't science. And if you ask today, what about the science of crime control? Well, it's not a science. Uh, it's some good guesses and some, uh, some good hopes, but it's just not a science. So police then are left with still with these residual func functions. What that means is that community policing, which essentially argues that police officers have the special knowledge, the professional knowledge, to deal with crime problems, uh, and therefore police officers should be allowed to apply that special knowledge, is really new, because no one had been saying this before. The whole tradition of policing had been the other direction, to control police officers, uh, and the notion that uh, police can figure out in the community and in the neighborhood what is there to be figured out is a dramatic break, and it's a break which really doesn't have any historical, historical precedent as far as I can see. And if we go back now to some data, here's my whole picture. Uh, let me explain this to you. But if, I, if you have questions, remember you can ask me. Here's the picture of the United States homicides per capita, 100,000, from 1900 to the present. And this is the same line for New York City. If we look just at New York City, which is easier to look at for lots of reasons and makes more sense, here's the, here, 1850, we start with the police not even yet in uniform, but wearing those removable badges. Uh, they get their uniforms right about here. This is the Civil War about here. You can see that, at least looking at homicides, police certainly don't have much to do with it. Either that or they're on the wrong side. Then after the Civil War, after 1863-64, there's this long decline in homicides, certainly down to about here, to 1910 or 1920. That's the period when, um, yes, the reformers were stepping in, creating a more professional police, but also, yes, when the New York City police were certainly at their most corrupt uh, and they're least likely to be able to do any good as far as crime goes. Uh, we get the technical innovations of the, uh, patrol, the radio patrol car here, 1931, just before the peak in crime. Crime, on the other hand, uh, homicide, on the other hand, continues to rise until about World War II. And then after World War II, down through the 1950s, homicide drops. And the same thing happens in the US as a whole. Now, this time period right here is hardly one where you can say policing made too much of a difference. And then we have the post-1950s era with soaring homicide rates, uh, both nationally and citywide, when from the point of view of uh, police innovation, a very professionalized police force has been created there's uh, actually coherent organization, so forth and so on. So what do the police have to do with, at least in this case, homicide uh, and probably crime in general? 
my own personal feeling is not very much. Uh, does community policing have something to do with this? For New York City, you, if you read the newspaper for New York City, what do we see as responsible for the decline in homicide? Community policing, right? You've got to have read that. It's, very, it's an appealing argument. Um, the only problem that I know of with the argument is that homicide started to drop at least six months before Bratton became commissioner and before anything looking like community policing began. So if it caused the, co if it did it, it did it beforehand rather than afterwards. There's some, there's some trouble with that argument, but nevertheless, I think in the past five years, we all know that community policing is being given to us as a solution. Now, I don't say it's not a solution, and I don't want to leave you with that uh, argument. I do want to say, though, that p community policing is new. It is a break with tradition. And if, if police reformers tell us that it's a return to tradition, to tradition they're probably wrong, and they're probably saying it because if you're doing something new, it'd be crazy to say this is new and risky, and be very wise to say, oh, yes, we're going to return to the way we used to do it, and we'll get back to that old high quality which everyone imagines. So it's a good rhetorical strategy. Is it a good strategy for crime control? Well, I hope it is, but I think it's way too early to tell. And let me stop at that point and start taking questions, because I can... I hope there are a lot of questions out here. And if there aren't, I'll make up some. I'll pro I promise. Questions? <coughs> Go ahead. I'm just curious if in your study of the history of policing, if there are particular periods, and if these periods might correspond some, somewhat with the discussion of police change, uh, if there are particular periods where the police are more Okay, the question is one I can't answer, but let me try. Uh, the periods in policing I see as the, the, the major period is about 1860 to maybe to around the turn of the century where the police are reformed, and then this whole era down to, let's say, World War II, where the police reforms are really introduced. And then the post-war era, which becomes more highly technical, tech, where technology, there is a technology like radio cars, and those can be introduced. And for the, so now let me go back. For the first period, the police use of violence, um, n no one studied it. My, I can only, so if, you, if we talk about police use of violence in the 19th century, any one of us can say something that sounds good. What I do know is I can tell you that, at least in New York City, police officers murdering somebody or shooting someone, committing a homicide in the line of duty, were arrested. Seems pretty clear, just like that. Um, and it's usually, the prosecution may not go very far, but there is an arrest, so there's a clear concern about this. As far as other forms of police brutality, one of the best known uh, police officers in New York in the 1880s was Clubber Williams. Okay? Do I need to say any more? Now, Clubber Williams uh, got a lot of media attention from the newspaper reporters because it was asserted that he kept his neighborhoods under control. Why would we believe that? Just He said, oh, there's no crime in my neighborhood. So? so? There's no measurement of it. There are no, there's no survey research, so he had a pretty good deal. Uh, so police, and my guess was, is therefore that police violence was, I don't know if, I don't know if it was acceptable, but it certainly was not conceived of this problem. The problem was, from the point of view of reformers like Roosevelt and others, police corruption. This is clearer. This is easy to understand. And from the point of view of reformers, this is a problem which is solvable. And it was. In the post, in the post, in the 20th, in the early 20th century, I'm not sure yet about uh, shootings by police officers. My own impressionistic evidence is, based on data from LA in the early 20th century, something like 10% of the shooting deaths in Los Angeles were by police officers. So this was not a problem. That is, if no one, 
is able to bring this to the table as a problem. It's not a problem. And it's only more recently, I think, that attention is being paid to this. So one of the things about, about using um, behavioral measures to, whether of crime or of police violence, the data aren't very good and they're often suspect. The one, that's, why, that's why what's actually going on is very difficult to know. And I'm sure many of you know the book by um, William Wesley. On, and Wesley's study done in the, just right after World War II actually didn't get published on the, on the, um, the what's the, the Indiana, uh, forgot, Gary, Indiana Police. Wesley's study didn't get published for about 20 years simply because one of the things he documented was the un un unauthorized use of police force uh, on individuals. Wesley's study, I think, didn't get published for a long time simply because it's not that no one believed it, it's just no one cared. And that's, that's the big difference. So that's not answering your question very well, but it's an attempt. This is something that's inherently studyable if we look at shootings. But as far, to my knowledge, no one has done this. The data are there. Go ahead. I Prophecy. It seems to me that if community-oriented policing is going to try to represent the values and the interests of the community, and if communities are increasingly afraid of crime and increasingly punitive in their attitudes, would you anticipate that we should expect to see communities becoming more tolerant of police use of force under the auspices of community-oriented policing? And, if, and, and I presume you're thinking of the case in New York City of the, of the torture of this uh, okay. Of Abner Luima, where well, okay, so it's, it appears that because it appe it seems like one aspect of community policing would be if unauthorized use of force gets results, then communities would be tolerant of it. And actually, I don't know if the data support this or not. Um, my guess is that policing has changed. The, the control of individual police officers has changed enough since the 1950s so that it probably would be unlikely, just like I suspect, I mean, for prophesying for historians is really difficult. Uh, I suspect this is going to be the, this is, what's the resistance to community policing? Well, imagine an organization that's worked for 150 years to get itself under control, whose main theorists uh, have worked at accountability at, at controlling individual officers whose job is inherently away from supervision, for that organization to change dramatically and let individual officers work, or groups of officers work without control, I, I can't imagine that's going to happen. I suspect that will be the main resistance to community policing. It's an organization which is designed, and it's taken forever to get it to where it is. So I think there'll be resistance, and I think the resistance will probably be wrongly interpreted as police don't want to change because I, you know, I don't know what the reasons will be, but it won't be understood that controlling individual officers is actually, even if the police, even if the police organization tolerates the wrongful use of violence, that doesn't mean the police want officers to be on the loose. I mean, the L, uh, LAPD is a classic example, given uh, the beating, which everyone saw many times on TV, of Rodney King. Remember. LAPD was a classically corrupt police department down until the end of the 40s. Uh, reform chiefs were bought in, they failed. This police department was involved in collecting money from vice, um, and that's how police officers made a lot. And there are, there are some great photographs from the 1930s of, of police officers actually stopping in their patrol cars, picking up payoffs at various betting places. When Parker reformed the LAPD and actually made it um, free of corruption. This was a major achievement. And Dragnet, the subsequent policing uh, in that department has emphasized its lack of corruption so that even down through Darrell Gates, the LAPD defended itself against whatever charges by saying, we're not corrupt. Now, in essence, they didn't get it. No one was caring anymore that they weren't corrupt, but it was a major achievement. And part of that achievement came by controlling individual officers. So how can this department then do a 180 degree turn and empower local officers? I think it will be incredibly difficult. And I think the difficulty, I mean, 
one of the implied potential problems will be more violence, but I think the other problem, which we've forgotten about to a considerable degree, is corruption. Because 50 years ago, corruption, and in the case of New York, it comes back now and then, but police corruption is, is also a major problem, and that's, what the, that's one of the things that the top-down careful organization is able to deal with. And this is, um, this is, I suspect, potential problem for community policing. If it's, it, but it's just that I don't. Th I suspect, and some of you probably know more than I do. Community policing means a whole bunch of different things. So what it means here is different from what it means in Boston, and certainly different from what it means in L.A. or New York. Yes, Mitch. Well, one of the problems with uh, community policing uh, and corruption is in, for instance, in the Chinatowns and areas where you have some organized crime activity, you have more opportunities for corruption. I think in New York, or at least some police departments, they, they've begun rotating uh, police in and out um, in the community policing, not leaving them in for a long periods of time. So, that, so again, the rotation of police officers uh, is a way to actually brace, break police from community co connections. So, if, so, one of the mis so one of the understandings of community policing, which is one that goes against tradition, is um, have police officers from the community. One of the, the th one of the first innovations of the English policing in the 19th century was to insist that police officers not police the area they're from. And it's still true. I don't think it's enforced anymore, but it's very often the case that police officers in one county in England are from someplace very far away, the idea being to break any potential corrupting influences. Community policing proponents don't actually say, oh, you've got to hire people from the community, but I think that's sort of the buzz that goes around it, and that buzz often goes with corruption. So uh, this, is, this is why community policing, whatever it looks like, won't, I suspect, be what the words sound like. Okay, more questions. Yes. Your comparison and analysis of community police and homicides. I understand at the beginning of your lecture you mentioned that homicide was completely implied um, because some of the other was, was difficult. But, but would you suggest that, or consider the fact that that may be more of a convenience than a relevance issue? Because if you look at homicide as uh, probably over 60% is non stranger sort of issue. And uh, also, if you relate to the fact that much of the, much, many of the issues addressed by community policing are issues of what we would consider nuisance issues, uh, even when, when Houston implemented their uh, huge number of officers, uh, they didn't really find any significant impact uh, on part one crimes. Uh, okay. So, how would you address that? Well, the FBI used to call um, homicide an irrepressible crime. So, just put in the category that we don't have anything to do. We can't have anything to do with that. But one of the problems, I think, one of the oversellings of community policing is, starting from the Broken Windows article, that controlling of nuisance offenses will lead to larger gains. That is, if, you only, if nu controlling nuisance offenders, offenses only means that there's no, no broken windows or no graffiti, well, that's kind of costly. So the implication is, and I think it's one which can't be theoretically justified, but it's really interesting that nuisance offenses are as significant as, as more important felonies. And then, by implication, <coughs> this would include serious violence like homicide. So that's the, imp I mean, that's how it has to be sold. And certainly the case of New York, that's how it is being sold. It's not just that there are few nuisance offenses and no squeegee men and so forth, but that, look, the homicide rate's gone down. So I think the, th the, the theoretical linkage is what we're getting is two things. We're getting cleaner streets, but we're also getting a reduction in serious violence. And your question is one which you're really asserting, and it's something I suspect may be right, but we don't know. And that is felony, serious felony offenses don't have anything to do with this. Well, then does that mean we give up on community policing? I suspect everybody here in some way or another thinks community policing is a good idea, even though probably everybody here would agree that, why is it a good idea? Can I actually just, how many of you think community policing is a good idea? Oh, come on, I'm not, I don't even know who you are. 
right? Okay, about 10. How many think it's a bad idea? Well, that's a strong vote in favor of community policing. How many of you who think it's a good idea think it's going to reduce serious crime? Okay, I guess I can say I'm on the same wavelength. The promise may be real modest, yet it's a significant innovation. And I think, I mean, maybe you're all just too educated to know that it's, that it's easy to reduce serious crime. But this is a problem. And certainly, when the public has to be, got, has to be brought on board with this, if, if homicide rates were going the other direction right now, as community policing, our versions of it was implemented, how many city council members would be on board? Can you imagine? It would be none. So it may be that the good luck of declining homicide rates, amongst other things, makes anything that's been happening recently seem like good policy. But is it good policy? Well, we don't really know. Thank you, Professor Montana. Would you join me in thanking him for being here?